pre-recorded. This is the Red Ticket Blues Podcast. I am Brian Buckley. This is being released on June 23rd, 2016. How is everybody doing? If you're new to the podcast and you want to hear shows from the past, well, check them out on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, YouTube, and now on Google Play. Get to hear commentary from me, interviews with Katie Baker, The Ringer, Scott Pollard, former NBA player, Phil Mushnick, Jeff Perlman, Chad Finn, you name it. All sorts of sports media guests, so check that out. And remember to follow me on Twitter at BrianBuck13 and at Red Ticket Blues. But today, what a guest. What a guest. A Mount Rushmore, there's no debate, a Mount Rushmore of sports writers, arguably the greatest sports writer of all time. And he sits down and talks to me about his new book, I'd Know That Voice Anywhere, and that is Frank DeFord. Yes, Frank DeFord. Um Gets into his commentaries from throughout the years, since 1980s, 36 years at NPR. And uh, I, I can't wait for everyone to hear it. So, But before we get to that, I just want to announce the new member of the Red Ticket Blues team, and that is Seat Swap. Seat Swap is, well, let's get into this. You've all used secondary ticket sites before. We've all done that. We've all the, we, we won't mention the names. They rhyme with Schmubhub. You get it. You, they, you end up taking a 50, 15% VIG on. You don't really get the full value of your ticket. Sometimes you only get 30% of what they're actually worth. Well, Seat Swap is different. They allow you to, you know, trade or swap with other fans yes you build a portfolio a profile you get to see people get to see the teams you're rooting for that you see that you're a real person not a bot so we all love playing armchair gm and uh, you know calling sports radio with with trades calling mike francesa you know they the c swap allows you to do that with your own tickets if you can't go to a game you can't go to the jets pass you can trade that with another fan if if you want to trade your billy joel for hamilton tickets well There you go. You can do that. And right now, SeatSwap is offering exclusive access to their private beta to Red Ticket Blues listeners, okay? So you get to have personal one-on-one demos with the founders, Dan and Josh, great guys, and they will show you how the website operates. And, you know, so you would contact them and, you know, just send them everything you need to know within reason to just make sure you know what you're doing. So if you're interested in getting to know what SeatSwap is all about, or just want to talk about New York sports, you can reach Dan at Seat Swap Tickets or Josh at Seat Swap Tickets, and they will show you how the site operates. Okay, so just remember the only place on the web, the entire internet where you can safely swap tickets with another fan is SeatSwapTickets.com. That's SeatSwapTickets.com. If you didn't hear me at the time before, SeatSwapTickets.com. So, thank you, Seat Swap. With that being said, Frank DeFord. For over 50 years, you have read him at Sports Illustrated. He's earned countless awards and published 19 books, including his latest, I'd Know That Voice Anywhere, my favorite NPR commentaries. He is Frank DeFord. Frank, welcome to the Red Ticket Blues podcast. Thank you very much, Brian. Delighted to be with you. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to have you here. Obviously, um, there's a lot of sports going on for you know sort of late June, but let let's start with this. The NBA Finals they're, they're all over with. They've concluded, and LeBron James has sort of done a metamorphosis, so to speak. He's after this masterful performance. You know, he he was before he was the villain who ran to South Beach. Now he's the prodigal son, uh, and it just sort of <laughs> happened in a few games. What do, what do you make of this? Well, I do I do think it's very unusual for any athlete to do what he did, which was to go back to um, his home area um, just because it was his home area. I mean, that doesn't happen very often. And not only that, with the idea in mind that I'm going to win a championship. And and the fact that he did it um, makes it, I think, even more extraordinary. We we, we talk about sportsman and uh this is the greatest example of sportsmanship that i can think of even though we don't usually think of it this sort of thing in those terms i think it's an extraordinary achievement on his part and uh ethically morally (laughs) in every in every way so you talk sportsman uh is it I know you probably don't want to have this conversation, but is is it time? Is it time to have that conversation? Is is he the equal of Michael Jordan or better, or, or should we wait till the I, end of the career? I think it's so hard to measure uh, different athletes in in, in different eras. And uh, guys, who 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 can really? 
tell whether Jordan or or James is the better. They, they're slightly different in in, um, in in what they accomplished and what they did. Um, I I just you know I just I, I I run away from the question because I I don't I don't think that I can intelligently answer it. And but you're certainly right that we should wait till the end of the career. Uh, before anybody starts to to, to make that judgment, uh, they're 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 both indisputably, I'd say, uh, one two in, in in the history of the sport. Yeah, a full body of work, I think, will uh, yeah due diligence for both of them, obviously. So, yeah. focusing on you, you've been with Sports Illustrated since 1962, and you know when NPR approached you in 1980 to do a weekly sports commentary. You know, what was that transition like from print media to radio? I mean, did you ever envision yourself doing something like this? No. And it was really funny because when they did approach me out of the blue, uh, I'd never done any radio. And and I just thought it would be sort of fun to do for a few months. (laughs) And uh, that was was 1980, and and now it's 2016, and, and, and... and I found out that that I enjoyed it very much. What was good about it, Ron, was that um, almost everything I did for Sports Illustrated were were long feature pieces, and commentaries are exactly the opposite. And so they didn't in any way conflict with each other. I was able to do, you know, the short things and the long things. It just it just worked out beautifully for me and NPR is such a broad audience that uh, it allowed people who uh, had never heard of me before working for Sports Illustrated to to to, to hear me so it's it's been you know just one of those fabulous serendipitous matters of luck is all I can say that's a, that's a perfect transition when you say sort of the long and short of it. I mean, yeah. when, you, when you do your commentary, you, you have three minutes to get your entire three thought minutes. to the listener. I mean, how often is great material sort of left on the cutting room floor there? Oh, lots. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, I I found out early on that you really had to you you could you couldn't digress. You, you you really couldn't. On the other hand, you don't want to just you know be staccato bing 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 and just cite statistics and and the obvious Uh, and so you have to pick your spots to get a few good lines in uh, or or otherwise it's 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 just another you know somebody bloviating and and shooting their mouth off so the trick the trick is to be direct, but at the same time to have an original idea and to try to get a couple of lines in that are memorable. That That's the perfect. Now, how often I achieve that, it, you know, I'm not batting a thousand, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, you know... Uh, we're going to go over some of them right here. I mean, some of your commentary that are included in the book. Uh, I'd know that voice anywhere. My favorite NPR commentaries. And, you know, I think it, well, in a few months or weeks for some hardcore fans, the, the NFL is going to take over the American sports landscape like it does annually. But, it, you know, in recent years, the scandals and, and health issues like concussions, have, they've painted a future comparable to, to boxing in, in a certain way. But you, you disagree. You think the NFL will continue, correct? Yeah, I think there's, you never should compare individual sports to team sports to entirely different things um, because team sports have allegiance, uh, whether it's for your high school, for your college, for, for your pro team. You know, you have a built-in fandom. Uh, take golf, for example. The interest in the U.S. Open this last week was minuscule compared to what it was when it had Tiger Woods or Jack Nicklaus at the height of their powers. It's the same thing with 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 tennis. That if you've got stars, 
people pay attention to individual sports. The stars go away, and 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 the interest diminishes, and 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 that's that's not true with with team sports. And and so to to compare boxing to to football is 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 just out of line. Now, having said that. I do think you will see a decline in uh, youth football, and I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see in a few years uh, a lot of colleges and, and high schools uh, give give up football. Really? That, I think, is in the cards, but there's always going to be enough people prepared to risk their brains for large sums of money uh, to play in the NFL. So I cannot conceive of a time when the NFL would not be in existence. So you could see a future with some of those just mega schools in Texas, maybe not them, but maybe other outside no. schools saying, you know. No. I think, I mean, somebody like Alabama, I mean, when you get into that, that that's the equivalent of the NFL. Right. Uh, the devotion to those Big colleges is 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 quite quite the same as 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 to the NFL. I'm talking about something like the Ivy League, ah. uh, Division Three, uh, th- throwing in the towel and saying it just isn't worth it. I mean, after all, remember, football is a very expensive sport. First of all, I mean, leaving aside the concussion, it's a very expensive sport, and there's no female analog. And so, right away, it causes problems with Title IX. Mm-hmm. So there are two good reasons to throw out football besides the health issue. What makes football, though, so difficult to get rid of at, at colleges and so forth is, is, is how emotional we are tied to it. It comes at the beginning of the school year. People go back you know, for, for homecoming games. Uh, you, you know, football is an event. It, it only takes place, by and large, on the weekend. Now, though ESPN has changed that around. They'd like it on but, every but, day. But, yeah, yeah. But, but, but basically, football is, is so woven into our calendar. Um, everybody talks about baseball and and it comes at the beginning of spring when, when the world is renewing itself again. But in many respects, uh, football is, 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 is more deeply imbued in, 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 in our culture than, than baseball is. And, and the fact that people, so many people go to high school football games, college football games, whereas baseball doesn't have that, uh, no, I, uh, I, I can see, I can see schools dropping football, but it will be a very emotional thing, and it'll be huge fights amongst the alumni and everybody else. Uh, you know. A lot of the solutions people say to the issues with football is, and you, you mentioned that it's also the expenses too. Is yeah, is is soccer um, now? Soccer now. Many people, you know, they predict that this will sort of take over. You've been critical of American soccer in the past, the the MLS, and and some soccer fans they were a little perturbed at you. Do you, do you see a football to soccer migration, or is it more what you just said before? There is it more just, uh, you know, football will just become smaller in general. I, I, th- I think that. I think um, part of the problem with soccer, whether you like it or not, is um, the schedule is already pretty filled up. When you've got four major sports, there's no lot of room for, for a fifth one. And, and I think as long as football remains popular, and remember I said that, I said it's not going to go away then it's not going to be as if soccer is going to take over completely. Will there be more soccer? Yes, uh, very definitely. As, as schools drop, 
uh, football. Soccer is an obvious alternative. Lacrosse would be a, 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 another sport that might profit by uh, f- football uh, being being eliminated here and there. Um, but I don't think soccer is ever going to be as anywhere anywhere as big in, in America as it is virtually everywhere else in the world. Yeah, and I know some soccer fans might be listening to this right now and saying, well, you know, uh, h- how can you say that about it's the global game, it's the global game. But I think the problem in the United States is, and you're well aware of this, I'm not recreating the wheel here, but all the best players play in Europe. Uh, they play six hours ahead of us. And, you know, that's where all the money is. And so it's not the same product it is here that it is in Europe. I don't think it's just the product. I think it's the very nature of the game. Uh, We grow up uh, expecting uh, much more proficiency uh, in in our athletes. I mean, listen, you simply can't do with your feet what you can do with your hands. (laughs) That's why we're human beings. And... And, and and bears and giraffes are are not are not our competitors, um, and and when you're used to seeing a a quarterback who can throw a forty yard pass and and hit a guy right on the fingertips while he's being you know rushed, or you see a double play, a six four three double play, or you see Stephon Curry or somebody dropping in a a three-point shot, and and then you compare that to what the best soccer players can do. Uh, I I think soccer suffers, and other other countries, most other countries, kids grow up with soccer. That's true, and and, and so they appreciate what they think is the beauty of the game. Whereas we don't think it's it's as good, and as I say, you can't argue with me on, on that one subject because uh, I, I think it's amazing what some of these guys can do with their feet. But uh, you know, a high school baseball player is more accomplished at what he does than than, than the greatest soccer players because it's just the nature of the human body. Uh, speaking of baseball, uh, Pete Rose, he recently spoke up regarding Ichiro Suzuki surpassing him in, I, I guess we'll call it total global baseball hits. Um, yeah. Most years we hear Rose's name when the Hall of Fame ballot is released and on induction weekend. Now, Pete Rose is banished, but every year known steroid abusers, they, they creep closer to that 75% admittance. You talked about this in the past. Is this scenario equitable? Uh I think that I thought for a long time that Rose should go in the Hall of Fame. Um, his, his last revelation uh, or lie yeah. Uh, that yeah he had bet all along as a player. I just finally got tired of him. You know right. that that Pete, uh, come on. Um, so it's. I can live with it. Steroids is something else again. No matter what you think of Pete Rose and that he broke the rules, he didn't hurt any other players. The steroid guys had had an advantage over the other athletes, which is what is happening at the international level right now, which is why the Russian track and field team is being banned from the Olympics because it's not fair to the other athletes. And so I'm sorry, but to my mind, the guys who use steroids, if if it can be proved circumstantially, um, that's enough for me to keep them out of the Hall of Fame. And they're a long way from, you know, from the 75%. Uh, That's... That's nothing that's that's going to happen in in the next few years. It may be that in, in, in a, another generation from now, when it's not quite as emotional an issue, and the personalities have been removed, um, that a couple of guys like Bonds in particular will will be admitted into the Hall of Fame. But they 
they hurt the game. They rules did. didn't hurt the game. It broke the rules, didn't hurt the game. And I think that's a huge difference. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, hurting the game, you just mentioned it, doping. Uh, so we're going to talk Summer Olympics, but we'll go a different angle here. Uh, they're rapidly approaching in Brazil, and it'll be starring Zika, pollution, crime, yeah. and more. Uh, <laughs> Cities continue every four years, every two years, continue to trample over themselves to get these games when, in reality, it rarely produces any any long-term effects. So why does this trend continue, and do you foresee Rio being one of the most flawed hosts ever? Well, the cities are wising up. I mean, look at the example of Boston. Boston that that was, would have been a disaster. I mean, and the, and the people said, no, thank you. And I think more and more cities uh, are saying that they're 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 desperate. The Olympics are to even get anybody to apply any uh, apply any longer for for the Winter Games. Winter Games are being held in Beijing, which doesn't have any snow, uh, and and we're we're down to to dictators uh, like Putin with the last Winter Olympics and 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 Beijing here. Um, putting on the winter games and and I think what's going to happen is that that more and more cities um, are going to take the same approach for the summer games that as you say there's there's no almost never are there any it gains the idea that you gain in 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 tourism uh, has been refuted it 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 it's it simply is not true. You don't even, you don't even make that much money. This is interesting. You don't even make that much money as a city during the Olympics than when the at a, at a, at, a, at a comparable time the year before, because your normal tourists don't come. <laughs> it's just people come for the Olympics, and so it's just. A, one group replacing another group, and the amount of money that's wasted on velodromes, for example. Nobody knows what a velodrome is, and yet it costs millions of dollars to have, you know, this this bicycle uh, auditorium. I mean, I think the first thing you should do uh, with with the Olympics is 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 pick. Three sites, say, um, just an arbitrary figure, one in Asia, one in the United States, one in Europe, and have those as permanent sites, you know, rotating. In other words, Los Angeles would get it every 12 years. Some place in Europe would get it every 12 years and some place in Asia. I mean, the idea that we have to, uh, it's a, basically a television show, and so the idea that we have to move it around so that anybody can, everybody gets a shot at it, is simply not 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 true anymore. It's it's a, it's an outdated model. And by the way, the same thing applies um, to the, to the uh, to the World Cup soccer. Uh, extraordinary amount of money that Brazil expended on. Uh, on building soccer stadiums that will never be filled again is just obscene. And, and in addition, you, you include in your commentary in, in your latest book about the Olympics, how the highest rated uh, day is when the day that there actually is no action, the actual opening That's ceremony. That's right. The, the Olympics are different. They, <laughs> they really so. are. They're, they're a, as I say, they're a television show. And yes, of course, they're a competition. And it's extraordinary competition, but uh, at a time at a time where there's airplane travel and people can move around, so it doesn't even make any sense to me that they're held every four years. I would think this should just be world championships that are held every year in every sport, uh, the same way that you know the soccer leagues in in Europe and. And, and our football and baseball and basketball and hockey leagues operate. I mean, why should it only be every four years that there's an Olympics? Uh, it's, it's just all wacky, 
because the system was set up back in the 19th century when there weren't airplanes and there weren't television. That's all. Just a tad antiquated. Um, Three weeks ago, one of the most well-known and controversial figures in our country passed away in Muhammad Ali. Uh, His full life was celebrated internationally, but many people forget that, you know, Ali wasn't universally liked at many points in his career. So what exactly changed? Uh, Very unusual, as a matter of fact, that that an athlete's, an attitude toward an athlete changes. Um, I think, first of all, people... Um, began to appreciate um, that he had been done a great injustice when he was banned. Um, when when public opinion turned more and more against the Vietnam War, that meant that more and more people said, you know, I guess Muhammad was right. Uh, I, 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 and then, of course, for him to come back and 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 have those great fights against Frazier and Foreman. I mean, just simply from a competitive point of view, um, people um, w- w- were more and more charmed by him. Plus, he always was, you know, a, a charming character. And then when finally he it was revealed that that he that he was damaged, obviously, by his boxing, um, the sympathy grew. So you add all those things up, and you can see how people shifted in their opinion of him, um, that he was no longer the same controversial character that he had been as a young man. Frank, I want to thank you for giving us a few minutes today. But before you leave, I have three quick questions to play us out. You ready? Sure. Okay. So, with the Golden State Warriors losing Game 7 a few nights ago, now, at this point, who is the greatest NBA team ever? The greatest NBA team ever? Yes. The greatest NBA team I ever saw was the... Philadelphia 76ers, they had a team which was, was bulwarked by, by, by Chamberlain, by Will Chamberlain. And it was the one year in, 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 in many that they beat the Celtics uh, in that string. I forget exactly what it was. It was either 67 or 68, I believe. And, you know, we've forgotten. That's like ancient history. Right, but that was a fabulous team. I mean, it was four deep in the forwards. Somebody like Billy Cunningham, who's in the Hall of Fame, came off the bench. Uh, Hal Greer, another Hall of Famer, was was in the backcourt, and he was Chamberlain at his best. And and the Seventy Sixers had a great coach in Alex Haddam. So. You know, again, you can't compare teams in in different eras, but from my money, uh, they're still the best. And they they almost had as good a, a regular season record, by the way, as 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 the Warriors did. I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but okay. they were fabulous. So, number two, what is the most exciting event you have ever covered? The most exciting event I've ever covered was the Borg McEnroe match at Wimbledon. Um, and again, I can't remember the year, but that was the one where the tie break went 20 to 18 or 22 to 20 or whatever it was. And then Borg played a perfect fifth set. Uh, to win it. I mean, that was as as many great events as I've I've seen. That was the most. You use the word exciting. It was it was just you know seat of your pants all all the way. I, somehow I think when it's just man to man, you know, that's 
more dramatic than when two teams play each other. And number three, out of all the athletes you've personally dealt with throughout your illustrious career, who was larger than life? Who stood out among the rest? Bill Russell. Really? I didn't expect that. Yeah, Bill, Bill, Bill Russell. Bill was <laughs> extraordinary in, 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 in every way as a personality, as a player, as a leader. Uh, and, you know, he was everybody as gutsy as, as Muhammad Ali when it came to speaking his mind. He, right. he, didn't, he didn't get banned like Ali did. Uh, but, uh, but, but Russell would be my choice. The book is I Know That Voice Anywhere, my favorite NPR commentaries. The phrase, it's an honor and a pleasure, is thrown around haphazardly, but I tell you, Mr. DeFord, it has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for coming on the Red Ticket Blues podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Brian. I enjoyed it. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was Frank DeFord. Yes, I just did a podcast with Frank DeFord. It was an honor and a pleasure not to be redundant. I don't care. I'm saying it again. So I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did the interview. Uh, it, it was great. So again, remember, you can uh, hear all the podcasts of the past on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, YouTube, and on Google Play. And follow me on Twitter at BrianBuck13 and at Red Ticket Blues. If you liked this podcast, you're going to love all the other ones. So I recommend you subscribe on whatever venue fits you personally. And if you really like it, tell people about it. Leave a rating, leave a review. Every bit counts because I care about you. Thank you. So, uh, hope everyone enjoyed that. Talk to you next week. With all that being said, I'm out of here. <laughs>